Well, hello, friends. May the peace of God be with you, around you, and fill your hearts to the rim and beyond. Uh, it's wonderful to be back at Calvary, and uh, what a blessed occasion to get a chance to share some teachings with you. Um, this wonderful opportunity to both look back and to look ahead. Uh, at a hundred years of teaching and preaching, and then to also anticipate what is to come. Uh, these days, it's kind of in vogue to worry about the future generation. Uh, why is it that we don't see young people in the church? It's the same way in temples. It's the same way in many mosques. Why is it that so many young people identify as, I'm spiritual but not religious? It's like, I want dessert but I don't want to eat the meal, you know? <laughs> what is it that we have done to religion to make it look in the eyes of so many young people as something which is inherently unspiritual, if not anti-spiritual? We'll get to that in just a second. But first, a story. Uh, there's a great medieval Muslim mystic, a saintly, illuminated soul, who goes to a gathering of religious scholars. And in my tradition, as is the case in many other traditions, if you want to prove that what you're saying is legit, then you say, I heard this from such and such, who heard it from such and such, who heard it from such and such, who goes all the way back, who heard it directly from the Prophet Muhammad. And the fewer chains you have, the lesser chances of it having had the game of telephone, if you ever used to play that game as a kid. And so this saintly being sits there very quietly and he listens for about an hour to people talking, I heard it from such and such, who heard it from such and such and such and such. And after about an hour, when his turn comes, instead of giving his own chain, he goes, where's the person that you heard it from? And the people say, well, I'm an old man now, and I heard it from him when I was but a young soul, so he's dead now. And where's the one that he heard it from? Oh, he died a long time ago. And so he finally goes, you all, are doing nothing but gossiping about dead people behind their back. <laughs> Does the living God of the infinite universe have something to say to your heart here and now? We would be fools, and we're not fools, we would be fools to not avail ourselves of 1,400 years, 2,000 years, millennia of wisdom that has come down to us. We would be cruel, and we ain't cruel, to not consider the impact that our faith or lack thereof might have on our children and our as of yet unborn grandchildren. But if you want to think of us as being a bird that has these two wings, on one hand stretching back to the ancestors, on one hand stretching out to our descendants, there's got to be a heart that connects the two wings. And in the time that I have, I want to urge us to be here and now and to become people who make God real. If we do our part, then the people who say someday, I heard such and such say such and such, aside from gossiping, they will have felt love. They will have felt seen and honored so that they can have their own experience of God, that living God who speaks to them just as God speaks to us and spoke to our ancestors. This is not theoretical. 
This is not hypothetical. Um, this morning I got up and like every believing Muslim, I went looking for a good cup of coffee. <laughs> Did you know that coffee was introduced to the world largely through Muslim cultures? It's true, look it up. And I went outside, then I looked it up, and there's a nice cafe around the corner. And as I'm walking there, there's an elderly friend, obviously homeless, who is being accosted by an overly enthusiastic young man who is, in his own mind, evangelizing to him. But if you could take the faith of our personal Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and make it as unbeautiful as possible, that's what it was. I think this is a direct quote. He was saying, if you can promise me that you're not going to mess around with witchcraft, homosexuality, and liberal ideas. And I was like, witchcraft, homosexuality? Like, that's, that's an interesting Venn diagram, you know? <laughs> Then I'll go and buy you a sandwich. Um, and I was cringing, and I was trying to figure out what do I do and how do I intervene. And by the time I thought about crossing the street, they had, they had departed. And it reminds me, of course, none of us have a monopoly on beauty. None of us have a monopoly on love. Right? This ain't the game of monopoly where like Christians put a house on love and anytime we talk about love you got to pay the Christians and <laughs> Jews don't have a monopoly on obedience to God through law you know like these are these are universals uh, and in my tradition there's also stories of a Zoroastrian man who lived right next door to a Muslim saint and on the other side of the Muslim saint was a fanatic he would have gotten along famously with the evangelical dude that I saw this morning. And the fanatic guy knows that the Zoroastrian man loves this Muslim saint. And so every day he's like needling him. Oh, if you like him so much, you should become Muslim. If you like him so much, you should convert. If you like him so much. And the Zoroastrian man is kind, he is gentle, he is patient. Until one day he's had enough. And so he goes up to this fanatic and he's like, you know, if being a Muslim is what that Muslim saint is, I'm not worthy of that. But if being a Muslim is what you are, I don't want to be that. There's a lot of thought and care given to how do we make faith real? How do we make it relevant? How do we make it something that our kids would want to look up from their devices and pay attention? How do we compete with TikTok? I let somebody else worry about that. Here's what I do know. What we got to do is to worry just a little bit less about making religion real and we got to work on making God real. And you might say, well, that's a strange thing to say. God's already real. How do you make the one who's the most real, real? We get another story. You heard a quote from one of the great Muslim luminaries, the great lover of God, Rumi. Um, he lived in what is today Turkey, that place that is in a lot of our hearts these days because of the horrific earthquake there. And there was a Greek man, a Christian man named Syrianus, who loved him so much. He loved listening to his words and teachings about the love of God that he started hanging out with him. And in order to get more out of being with him, he started to learn the Persian language, the language that Rumi spoke. Now, some of y'all, or as we say, the plural of y'all, all y'all, 
I mean, come on, like, you know, English is my third language, Southern was my fourth language, <laughs> and I had to learn at some point that y'all is not y'alls, and it's not you guys, it's all y'all. Um, I learned this thing. And learning a language is hard, and learning a poetic language, an elegant language, like Persian, is really hard. So this poor Greek soul, Syrianus, is always messing up. So for example, in that world, you would call someone Lord such and such, in the same way that in Victorian era English, we did the same thing, except he messes up, and instead of calling Rumi Lord Rumi, he calls him capital L, Lord, God. He calls him God Rumi. And there's a bunch of fanatical people who come and they drag him in front of a judge. Look at this infidel. He just called Rumi God Rumi. And the judge, who seems to be a very patient and understanding person, he says, son, he calls him son. Son, Rumi's an old man. He was born and he will die. Surely you don't mean to call him God. And Syrianus, the Greek man, is like, ugh, I always do this. This Persian thing is such a hard language. I always mess up. No, I didn't mean to call him God. And the fanatics are like, man, we thought we were going to burn him at the stake. We thought we were going to have a rotisserie of infidels. But we didn't get to kill anybody yesterday, and it looks like we're not going to get to kill anybody today. This is like the worst week ever. And so they start to walk out. And for some reason, the judge thinks about asking a follow-up question. And the question that he asks is, son, what did you mean to call Rumi? And Syrianus perks up. He gets really excited. And he goes, oh, I know this one. I meant to call him Godmaker. Godmaker. The fanatics do a little, <laughs> go on. Maybe we will have a bonfire today after all. And the judge goes, son, if we just agreed that Rumi is not God, how can he be Godmaker? I always do this, I always mess up. This is such a hard language. What I meant to say was, he makes God. Real to me. He makes God real for me. He says, before I met him, love was a word on a page. I saw how he looks at me. I saw how he looks at everybody around him. I knew love was real. I knew God was real. If we wish for faith to have a future, we have to be God-makers. We live in a world in which there is plenty of people who are fear-mongers. Politicians are good at this game. How can we frighten you so that you will follow whatever recipe we're selling? I am begging of us to be love mongers, hope mongers, beauty mongers. I'm begging us to have courage, courage not meaning to go bungee jumping, not meaning jumping off an airplane with a parachute. The word courage comes from ko, which is heart. Have heart. Let your heart shine. So how do we do this, right? The great Rumi says at one point, I prayed so often that my whole being became a prayer. 
whenever somebody sees me, they start to pray. Jesus tells us, oh, Father, teach me how to pray. Right? It's not enough to pray. We've got to be taught how to pray. So how do we go about making God real? In the last little bit that I have, that's what I want to talk about. There's a beautiful passage in the Quran in which God speaking in that beautiful, majestic, we voice says, we will show you our signs in three places. In scripture, in nature, and in you. We'll show you our signs in scripture, in nature, and in you. The scripture part we talk about, and maybe too much. So I'll skip over that for today. The nature part, right? Think about how it is that if you go into the woods, you feel a sense of calm. If you find a brook or a stream, and you sit and you put your feet in the water, you breathe a little bit more easily. Right? The sound of the waves from the ocean relax you. And when you hear that, remember that it's not so much that you're going into nature. You yourself are nature. And nature delights in nature. That in you, which is a sign of God, delights in that wind, that breeze, that butterfly, that leaf, that brook, that is also a sign of God. If you look at it in that way, there are lessons and reminders all around. Last time that I stood in this very pulpit, I shared with you the story of how redwood trees, the tallest trees that we have in North America, or just about, they're 200 feet tall, but their roots, or that which in Southern English we call roots, <laughs> their roots are only six feet deep. How can it be that some of these trees were alive at the time of Muhammad, at the time of Jesus, that they grow to be two, three hundred feet tall, they live for two thousand years, but their roots are only six feet deep? How come all these hurricanes and storms that have come haven't knocked them over? Because those trees are saints. They've figured out the thing that we, as a human community, still need to learn. I know you all are doing a beautiful job of living into it, and we've got more work to do. And that lesson is those trees reach out in their roots, and they grab hold of one another. And when one of those trees starts to wobble and starts to fall, the other trees grab it and they say, we're not going to let you fall. And if you fall, we're all falling with you. And 500 trees can't fall together. We would do beautifully well to learn from that. If anybody in our community falls, we fall. We're wrapped up in this together. That also applies to us. These trees are extraordinary teachers. Sometimes when you go into these ancient groves, to me, they're more holy than any church, any mosque, any synagogue. You see that they've grown in a circle. And in the middle, there is a tree, short one, sometimes just a stomp, that is burnt. It was probably hit by lightning at some point. And yet, mysteriously, there's this circle of trees around it. And there was this sign that I found 
in um, Moyer Woods in California, which said, a terrible tragedy fell upon that central tree. It was hit by lightning. It lost its life. It suffered incredibly. Period. End of paragraph. But the tree did not die. The roots of the tree were still alive. And the roots of the tree resurfaced all around as new shoots, as tender new trees, as this new family that is the tree and is born again. Sometimes we can look back on our own life, and there are periods of our life where you might feel like you were dead. You feel like, what happened to that 20 years of my life? I blinked and it was gone. I was in that marriage and it was awful. I was in that cubicle and it was a good foreshadowing of hellfire. <laughs> but the tree did not die and you did not die because there is that breath of God that has been breathed into you and that will never die. It will continue living. So part of it for us is this recognition, let the earth be your teacher, let the trees be your teacher. That same great Rumi has a reminder about death, and these days I'm thinking a lot about death. Last time I stood at this pulpit, it was just a few hours after 60 of my fellow community members were gunned down in a mosque in New Zealand. And I have to confess, I love coming to Memphis. I love coming here. I love being with you. I always go to Lorraine Motel. That's holy ground for me. And this time around, I also come here with the heavy heart for the sake of Tyree. And I think about his death and the wounds of that family and my community as well. I don't want to minimize death and suffering because it's real. If you have that thing in your heart that says the way things are is not the way that they ought to be, then that means that your heart is still alive. That means that that divine spark in your heart still knows that there's a better way, that there's a higher path. So heed that. Right? Never let that be overcome with callousness. Right? When you talk about the pain and the suffering of our fellow human beings, the homeless, queer friends, Jews, Muslims, black folk, undocumented folk, the list is long. End with a pause where we absorb their grief, our grief, rather than comma but. The minute that we respond with, yeah, but what about, is already when we've lost something and something quite important. In the last five minutes of God, I want to also talk about each other. We'll show you our signs in scripture, in nature, and in yourselves. Uh, it's always flattering when somebody says, you know, Omid's a teacher of radical love. Uh, I appreciate that, and that is what my life is devoted to. I love the fact that the word radical doesn't just mean when you're willing to go to the utmost, to the extreme, 
But radical also comes about by going to the roots. We got to figure out what are we rooted in? What is the root of the root of the root of your being, as Rumi would say? And so here's a few very simple practices that I want to leave with you, inshallah, God willing, until we get to be together again. When you see somebody, the easiest thing to ask them is, how are you? It's a stupid question. It's a worthless question, and worthless questions usually get worthless answers. Right? You know how teachers love to say, there's no such thing as stupid questions. That's not true. <laughs> there's some really stupid questions. I've been asked lots of stupid questions in my life, you know? How are you? I'm fine. Well, I'm so grateful that we wasted 30 seconds of our precious, your one wild and precious life, as Mary Oliver would say, to have this pointless conversation. In my tradition, instead of asking somebody, how are you, to which either people say, I'm fine, or, you know, I'm so busy, I'm so busy, I'm so busy. It's like this painful head nod. So busy, so bu I've never met a happy, busy person in my life. It's like, I'm so busy, I'm so busy, and I love it. It gives me purpose and meaning, and I see God being manifested in my busy. I've never seen that person. In my tradition, what we ask instead of how are you is you very gently put your arm on that person's shoulder, on that person's elbow, and you say, how is your heart? How is your heart in this breath? And then you pause. And that friend has an opportunity to look inside their own heart. How am I? How is my heart? And they might say, you know, actually, my heart feels really tight in this moment. Alhamdulillah. Praise be to God. My heart feels expansive. Praise be to God. But then they don't tell you how many emails they have in their inboxes or how many things are on their to-do list. It's an invitation to return to the heart where God is and has never left. To so practice that with people that you're close to, right? Arm on their arm. How is your heart? And here's the other one. And if you're seated next to somebody, and if you're moderately fond of them, try this. I want you to turn to the person next to you and look into their eyes. And if you happen to be friendly slash partner slash married and still not hating each other, Look closely enough into their eyes and allow yourself to get a little closer and then tell me what you see. You might have to take off your glasses if you got shiny glasses. When you see it, you'll know it. But you got to get close to see it. By the way, doing this in a college campus is like a disaster because it's like <laughs> uncomfortable giggling at this thought. What do you see if you allow yourself to get really close? Like you can't do that, like leaning back. Okay, yes, I see you from... If you allow yourself to get close enough, what do you see? What is it? Love. Love. And then the lady in the blue shirt? Myself. Yourself. If you allow yourself to get close enough to somebody, you see a reflection of yourself in their eye. There's something of you in them when you allow yourself to get close enough. When you look at somebody with a glance of love, you're looking at them through God's eyes. Right? This is one of the teachings of the Prophet Muhammad. 
the prophet says that when God's devotees come to God, then God says to them, I become the eyes by which you see, I become the hands by which you touch, I become the ears by which you listen. When you see somebody through the glance of love, you don't just see them. You see everybody who has ever loved on them. Every grandmother who ever held them, every mama who ever changed your diaper. Every person who has ever loved you is not dead. They are that tree that did not die. And if we can practice being here and now, looking at each other, and not just the ones we like, not only the friend who's temporarily homeless, this is hard for me, even that obnoxious evangelical, probably Republican guy this morning. <laughs> like that's, as y'all would say, that's my cross to bear. How can I see the presence of God in obnoxious Republicans? Like, that's a challenge for me, and yet i got to work on it myself. If you want to make God real, be God's eyes. Be God's hands. Be God's ears. If we do that, then we can come up with a kind of of a path, a way of being with God, where religion starts to look really different. What most religion is, in all traditions, is we love to use the metaphor of honey. Jews love it, Muslims love it, everybody loves it. Is that somebody brings a bowl of honey to you and they hold it up and you're like, look at this bowl of honey. Look at its gorgeous amber color. And you're like, oh, I do see, I do declare, that is an amber color honey. And then a person, a prophet, a mystic, a minister, an imam, a rabbi, takes their finger, usually a guy, dips it in the bowl of honey, puts it in their mouth, and they go, mm, 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 I do declare <laughs> that that is one sweet honey. And then the congregation goes, mm, 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 I do declare that the minister, the imam, the rabbi, the mystic, the prophet put the honey in his own mouth and he did declare that the honey is sweet. What we got to do is to have enough faith in each other, to have enough faith in the young people to know that they don't just need our wisdom, though they do. We got to make sure that they have a bowl of honey that they can dip their own fingers into and put it in their own mouth and taste their own sweetness and to have faith in their experience while benefiting from all the people that have ever love glanced into us. So let's work on that. Let's work on that and see what happens. Let's work on having a breath that mingles. Every time you're breathing, your breath is mingling with the people here, with all the trees outside. Let's work on being the soul of every place that you are. Let's work on sanctifying wherever you are with your full-hearted presence. Be here, be now. The past and the future and the now have a loving Lord who will take care of things. We just have to be present with all of ourselves. Be well, friends. May your glances be filled with love. May your touch be always a touch that brings comfort to the people around you. May we not just hear each other, 
may be listen with the ears of God, may we leave enough pauses for God to be revealed in the silences. And my prayer for you, now that I've gone 10 minutes over, as every brown person does, I mean, God talked to us, right? And we, what can we do but return the favor? God wasn't silent. God talked, and we talk. My prayer for you and for us is, may God bless you. May God illuminate you and make your lives whole. Amen. Courageous love mongers holding each other up. <laughs>